Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode. Today we're doing a really special farm tour with my friend Brian. And Brian actually apprenticed with me for six months, uh, learning all the different farming skills necessary to do a backyard urban garden. And now here he is with his own plot, killing it. And so I'm really excited to show you guys uh, what he's been up to. And we're gonna sit down with him after the farm tour and find out more about his personal story and how he got into this and um, you know the avenues that he's starting to sell into. And I think it's gonna be really valuable for other farmers who are super new to this or people who are you know thinking about doing this or changing their job. I think it'll be a really inspiring story for you. So let's go and meet Brian and he's gonna show us all around his farm and how he's growing everything. All right, Brian, here we are at your farm, and um, it's looking beautiful out here. Thank you. Yeah, so I just want to know, so how many square feet are you working with on your small farm here? So here we got a little bit over 2,000 square feet of actual growing space, and then another 1,000 square feet in the corner, which I'm using for you know my processing and storage uh, needs. Very cool. And uh, I'm curious what you're uh, growing. It looks like lots of different greens, a lot of yeah. turnover stuff. Yeah, so... As you mentioned, like I apprenticed under uh, our very own Stephen Cornett here, <laughs> and we're both heavily influenced by the Curtis Stone model. So the, the bulk of it is basically just the Curtis Stone model. I'm growing, um, you know, 60 days to maturity or less. Leafy greens, you got your radishes. Uh, I'm doing carrots as well. Nice. You know, beets, the typical market garden stuff. Excellent. Yeah, I'm trying out some little deviations from, from what you're doing, uh -huh. but uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, how did you start this plot off? How did you develop it in the first place? You know, or what was here? Yeah. Here in the beginning. Yeah, um, you can see um, my Instagram account uh -huh. at Home to Home Farms. Uh -huh. um, the before and after pictures, like before, it was just really overgrown, dead brown, just not pretty looking grass. Uh -huh. So I had to come in here first with a sod cutter. Nice. Take all that out. You know, load up, load up a giant U-Haul truck, pretty big one. <laughs> take it out to the dump, and then after that, it was uh, one use of a, a rototiller. Mm -hmm. And then um, I used the uh, compost contact that you gave me and I bought mm -hmm. about 12, 14 yards. Nice. And then with the help, of the, help of the, with a couple of friends, we just lay that, lay that out in, okay. the, in the beds. And nice. um, so that's the, bulk, that's the bulk of my fertility is the, um, that really good and high quality compost from a local grower Perfect. around here. Perfect. And looks like you've got, are these 30 inch beds? What's your walkway size? Yeah, this is standard, your 30 inches. Um, mm -hmm. My walkways are, I'm pushing it down to, it's about 10 inches or so on the walkways. That's nice. how I was able to fit an extra um, 55 foot bed in here. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it looks like you, you took it all the way to the fence there. Yep. And I had plenty of, plenty of practice at Steven's place and with really tight walkways, so yeah. I'm used to it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, when we're in these backyards, it's like we got to just max it to as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you got uh, irrigation set up here. Oh, Did you yeah. show us the irrigation setup and, and uh, why you chose it? Yeah, so like half of what I know, I learned from, from you. Mm -hmm. And the other half is like a mix of like Curtis Stone and Connor Crickmore. Nice. So this irrigation system is, I, I basically watched your videos on your, your channel. Uh -huh. And then based on that, I mean, I did follow your most recent advice and I have these uh, cuppers that are detachable. Mm -hmm. This way I can take off, you know, the entire mandible, move it along the side yep. to prepare the uh, entire bed without having to mess with each individual uh, drip line. Yeah. And I see you have the, you got the twist off connectors um, all along the way there too, mm -hmm. which I, I like. I actually, I think that was really smart that you did that. And um, I think I would have, if I was going to do it again, I'd probably do the same thing. If you need to move it someday, it's really easy. You can just yeah. take it apart and put it back together. So we just checked out uh, how your drip tapes run. Mm -hmm. um, now let's check out how's your, um, how you're connecting to the house and everything. So it's similar to the system you have actually, Steven, mm. where I've got one timer here. Uh -huh. This is a single port timer. Uh -huh. And then a separate timer here that right. goes to the actual drip lines. Uh -huh. And why did I do this? The reason I did this was because we can't have these filters under constant pressure. Right. Yeah. So I didn't make a change from yours where I bought this brand of uh, port, single mm -hmm. port timer, it's Gideon. Yeah. Where I what, found with, what do you like about this one? Yeah, where I found with the, um, the Orbit ones, it, when it shuts off, it shuts off way too abruptly. Right. And it creates this issue called a um, water hammer, I think. Yes. And that actually caused some problems with this setup here where I was getting after it kept shutting off, I would notice a rattle in the mm -hmm. PVC piping here. Mm -hmm. I got leaks here, I got leaks here. Oh yeah. It was a really big headache actually. 
Yeah, you're the one who taught me about this. You guys have probably seen my video about the water arrester here. So Brian's the one who taught me about that. I got that on my new plot because I had the same problem with my orbit timer, shaking all the pipes and creating a leak. Yeah, so going forward, I definitely use this water arrester uh -huh. and this Gideon timer. And I think with that, we'll have no it's more much issues better. with uh, yeah, that shaking. Nice. Yep. And Very then, cool. Uh, so then you're running the, uh, the boogie brew filter or uh, some mm -hmm. type of chlorine filter? Yeah. So I got split here. So I use this chlorinated water for you know, my washing. Yep. Just to have that extra I don't know, Pressure. sanitation. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. That yeah. too. That, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I have the filter for the, um, you know, to be bio microorganism friendly, uh -huh. right? And then your typical four-way splitter. Mm -hmm. I did find out though that, like I have one, um, uh, one valve. I tried doing that for this entire main section oh, over here. Yeah, yeah. Not even close. Not even close, yeah. I can do like two or three of those beds. Yeah. And I have to alternate it manually. Sure. Now. So if I were to do it again, I'd probably look into this, maybe some custom PVC rig and then, I don't know, invest in like eight separate yeah, valves. More valves yeah. or running three quarter inch poly, something like that yeah, too. Yeah, something like that. Then you're running the, yeah, just the, the poly line to your drip tape. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Now these two carapeds look really great. They're, um, are you getting close to harvest on these? Yeah. So. They're a little bit deceiving because I planted them seven rows with uh -huh. the earthway cedar. Uh -huh. I was following Curtis's advice on the seven rows. He uses the uh, the jank cedar. Right. So I think it's just with the earthway and the seven rows, it's just a bit too dense. Mm -hmm. I'm what I'm finding is I can harvest the ones in the perimeter of the bed. But the ones on the inside are just not close to being ready. Mm -hmm. So going forward, I actually started doing uh, five rows. Okay, nice. Uh, here you can see some. I had some issues with something eating up um, my carrot saplings. Yeah. Um, might be cutworms or something else. Right. Um, yeah. So for now, I just interplanted with Hakurai turnips and cool. a couple of lettuce heads here and there. Nice, that's really smart. Yeah. Got the perfect germination. He's coming in there, still gonna finish out those carrots, and then he's got some long growing turnips and some quick lettuce in there. It's really yeah. good. So over here, I'm trying five rows, but I ran each row, I did two passes with the earthway. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure I got some 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 sort of right. germination going on because I find I have for some reason I have pressure on this side of the yard huh. But not on that side for some reason so interesting this yeah the germination looks really good here Yeah, so this is two rows or two passes with the earthway and then I throw this burlap on top to keep the moisture in Yep, and so far the, it's looking pretty good. Yeah, it's looking really good So then I noticed next to here. I don't know what these cups are but uh, tell us more about that yeah, So I mentioned I had cutworm issues. Uh -huh. I mean like I am truly a first year farmer because four months ago I didn't know what cutworms were even. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean I've had terrible luck with transplanting beets. This is like my last ditch effort of trying to make it work mm. where so I have the transplants in and then I have these little rings made of um, cardstock just a stapler. Uh, yeah. And so far that seems to have worked. I'm not seeing any more um, cutworm damage for the nice. ones that have them. Very cool. But that's that might be an option going forward. I think I'll definitely use it with um, the kale and chard. There's not too many of them, mm -hmm. and I can justify the labor. Right. Nice. Um, so, so these, yeah, it's just basically like a physical barrier so the cutworm can't get on the plant and chew it up. Yep. Yeah. And over here, I did um, direct seeded beets, three rows with the earthway, mm -hmm. as you advised me. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know, we'll see how that works out too. Cool. So, yeah, in this first year, there's a lot of uh, experimentation, seeing what works, what mm -hmm. doesn't work, what your customers want. Yeah, I got plenty of mistakes to show you guys. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the part of it, you know, especially the first season, but the second season also, you know, there's mm. just, there's so much to learn and experience. And then you just get so much better after that. So, but you're doing really great. I mean, oh, thank there's, you. So, there's so much good stuff going on here. So I also noticed you're, um, you're staking your beds as well. Could you tell us a little bit about staking and why you like to do it? Oh yeah, I'm a fan of stakes just because it's um, a reference point I can re rely on. You know, if you don't have stakes, you, you might find that your beds migrate left and right. They get kind of wavy. Yeah. And um, with the stakes, I can just eyeball my, my lines. I find it helps me decrease my bed prep time. Oh, cool. Because I can just not be super anal about straight lines, but generally get it to line up with the stakes uh -huh. with a simple hand rake. Do you run a string on it as well? Or are you just using the kind of the stakes? I used a string in the very beginning when I was setting it up. Yeah. But so far I've had, I've had no problems just eyeballing it. 
Cool. Keep mistakes as my basis point. That's good. Yeah, that's good to know. And it saves yourself a little more time too. So tell us um, about your lettuce production and, and how you're, you're going forward with that. Yeah, so starting out, I thought I'd try focusing more on lettuce heads as opposed to your, your typical salad mixes. Mm -hmm. um, I did it because I, I was drawn to the, to the um, appeal of not having to, you know, manually go through your lettuce mix and pick out your weeds and, right. and rinse them and worry about keeping them fresh in the, in the bags and all that uh -huh. as much. Although I have started selling now and I've, I've found people just love their, their salad mixes, yeah, don't they? They do, yeah. They just love the convenience of it. It's just so easy for them. Yeah, so. so I think I'll switch to salad mixes along with some heads. And yeah. As you can see, I've got some uh, nasturtiums growing along the side here. Yeah. Which I plan to, it's sort of a fun thing, but also I plan to just, um, you know, throw in a flower into each of my individual salad mix bags. Yeah. Give that'll it that look, personal touch. Yeah. Justify that extra dollar or two we're yeah. charging. Yeah, I think that'll look beautiful. And they taste really great too. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of chefs are really into the nasturtium. Right now, how are you harvesting your salad mix? Starting out, I am. I tried to avoid these pretty big costs with the tilther and mm -hmm. the quick cut greens harvester. Yeah. I mean, so far starting out, I'm not. I haven't um, started selling to a proper market yet, so I've been able to get by just hand harvesting with um, yeah. a knife and. Yeah, and lots of people do that, especially with the. Um, uh, I met a few people that grow Salanova on my recent Dallas trip yeah. and they do it all by hand. They'll come in and they har they harvest it and then it'll, they'll let it come again. So they'll just grow the head and then um, it just keeps growing. Cause I guess the Salanova is a little harder to use the, the greens harvester on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's interesting seeing the different ways that people do it. Some people use the harvester and some don't. And then yeah, doing it by hand is, is still, it's still efficient enough it seems that it's profitable. So that's really cool. I wanna ask you about this. What? This is my first salad mix bed I've ever grown, basically. Oh, cool. It looks and great. Then, well, yeah, well, I found that I left it too long. I let it mature too long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've seen this, seen this before, where I get like, it's kind of rotting, yep. gross stuff in the base of that. Yeah, if, I've noticed that when I, if I plant it a little bit too thick, especially, mm -hmm. we know we've gotten a ton of rain recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets kind of an outbreak of some sort of fungus and then it eats away the, the, the roots and you should lose a little bit. Do you? It happened to me too, actually, this season. Huh, so even if you cut early on, you still get that, that rot? Yes, it can still happen, huh. even when they're kind of baby size. And it's kind of a thing with lettuce. It gets like a root rot real easy if it's too wet for too long. Yeah. So I've kind of tried to back off on how many seeds I'm drawing, or uh, how many rows I'm doing. I kind of backed off back to like 10 rows now. 10 rows now. Rather than maxing it like I was doing. And um, I'm noticing the yields are about the same and there's like, you know, a little bit better airflow. So I'm still, you know, I'm still playing around with that stuff too. So you have some slug pressure you're saying, and tell me how you're dealing with that. Uh, for now, I just literally Googled, you know, DIY slug trap uh -huh. on YouTube. And I found this nice little video where it's like you get a basic container, a plastic container, uh -huh. fill it with like this solution of, what is it? Water, sugar, flour, and active dry yeast. Whoa. Then you just bury it with slits uh -huh. and the slugs will fall in and then you'll get like eight slugs overnight. Whoa, that's really cool. So I'll cool. try that out today and we'll see how that works. Oh, cool. Thanks for that tip. That's really interesting. Yeah. I've never heard of that one. That's, that sounds like a really good way to do it. It's the beauty of YouTube. Yep. And then you don't, you're not spraying anything on your plants. Mm -hmm. It's just a little trap for them. Mm -hmm. You can knock down their population. So what varieties have, are you starting with here with your, so for your heads, what are you growing? And then for your mixes, what have you so the experimented with? The varieties are pretty much the same. Um, we got uh, butter crunch. Mm -hmm. We got uh, oak leaf. Nice. Uh, little gem romaine. Nice. This, what is this? Red salad bowl. Mm -hmm. And in the mix, I threw in this endive. This is green oh. curled ruffic. Nice. I like it because it adds a nice visual flair and variety. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I tried growing them as heads over here. Uh -huh. They're just they're taking way too long. It's yeah. Like Seventy to hundred, they said on the catalog. So I'll stop growing that as heads, but uh -huh. I'll, I'll keep them in the mix. I like the way they. The interest they add. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love having something a little different in there, something that pop of color, something that you know it makes it more unique. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the brassicas you're growing. Uh, what kind of radishes are you trying out? So I got your Easter egg, your standard Easter egg. Uh huh. But then I'm also trying out these French breakfast radishes, yeah, which at least nice. my, my couple of times selling now, I find they're pretty popular, at least around my part. Cool. Like they're unique enough to uh -huh. catch some people's interest, uh -huh. but they're not too foreign where it'd be alien, right? They're still radishes. Yes. And the people like the flavor of them. Yeah, yeah. And it, but it's the, really, really the visual appeal that, oh. that gets people, I think. Yeah, because it has like, it's kind of white on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice gradient, yes. red, pink, white. Yeah. And they're striking to look good, I oh. think. 
Yeah, that's a great recommendation for people. Yeah. And what kind of uh, arugula here? So this is uh, Esme arugula. Esme. This is up a high mowing. Supposedly it's got like a, more of a nuttier uh, flavor. Than a and I like the, the leaves look really good. I know the chefs like the leaves that look more like this mm -hmm. versus the rounded leaf from what I've experienced at least. Yeah. Now my strategy was to get varieties that mm. were different enough to be like, I like it. to be interesting. Mm -hmm. But there's still, you know, vegetables that people are familiar with. It's still arugula, right. it's still spinach. Yes. Yeah, that's a great strategy. Something a little extra special, but they still know what it is. Mm -hmm. you, may, you can't get in the grocery store, but mm, that tastes really good. So I see you have uh, some row cover here. How are, you, how are you using it? Yeah, I'm just, and this is, again, first time using row cover. Mm -hmm. So I'm just throwing them on things where I've had issues with. I had an earlier planning of French breakfast radishes over there. Yeah. And I only got like 45% of actually usable radishes because half of them were just ravaged by some oh, sort of bug. Wow. But um, it might be the row cover here, but I'm noticing I'm getting a better um, percentage of usable uh, radishes here. Nice. So you're using it as part pest protection and then you're getting a little bit more warmth here now because it's uh, we're in middle of February right now. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Yeah, I love that. I love that about row cover. It's kind of multi-purpose. So, uh, how's your weed pressure? Being in a backyard, usually there's grass, and you know, like usually homeowners just let a lot of weeds go to seed and things like that. So, how, how's it been? Yeah, it was pretty bad in the beginning. Um, so, as I mentioned before, it was just completely a blanket of dead grass. And then when I used the side cutter, I tried to just throw away as, as mm -hmm. much as possible to maybe minimize the mm -hmm. amount of seeds left over. Mm -hmm. But I got pretty thick. Um, grow back of grass. So in the beginning I just used um, stirrup hoe. So basically I ended up taking the um, Connor Crickmore approach, which is something like just staying on top of your cultivation, where you're mm -hmm. cultivating rather than weeding after the fact. Okay. Right? So I got this is a little plug, free plug for Connor here. Yeah. I got the um, <laughs> the mutineer oh, cool. hoe. I can show you I'll show yeah, you. Yeah, I've that. never used it. Um, I like it because you've got this function here where you can just swap out the heads. Okay. It's really easy, um, and the idea with this is that you know you're cultivating in between your crops, getting your weeds in your um, earlier phases of their development. Okay. They're in that you know that cotyledon stage. Uh huh. I use the um, stirrup hoe for the rows. Uh huh. I'll, I'll just walk down the rows and yeah. tear up the grass that grows back, and then so in the rows, using the wire use, hoe. Or the... I use these finer, um, like two inch mm -hmm. or whatever it is wire hose and then mm -hmm. little um you know mutineer hose that come with this tool here i mean i think your your weed pressure looks really good honestly um especially inside of the beds it, it looks fantastic already so i mean that's like it's just a testament to no till and if you're really vigilant on staying on top of those weeds then you know the seed bank goes away pretty quick it looks pretty darn good yeah i, I think <laughs> also the um the compost too acted as oh. a natural barrier. Yeah, I've yeah. noticed that too. So, That's good. I mean, when I first applied the compost, I mixed it in with um, the stirrup hoe just for a, a light mixture. Uh -huh. And then after a few weeks of dealing with the weeds that came up from that, and then on top of that, using your more finer weeding tools, yeah. or cultivating tools rather, mm -hmm. I've had, yeah, not too bad on the weed pressure. Great. Yeah, it's great to see. So it looks like you're starting out some microgreens. Uh, tell us how that's been going for you so, yeah. and, and what, it's, what it's all about. Here's the visual representation of my learning curve, basically. <laughs> like, I mean, pea shoots, they're all right. I'm trying to figure out how to get more height on the uh, microgreens. Uh -huh. um, I guess it's a, some sort of combination of not having enough depth of medium growing medium. Mm. Maybe it's not getting enough sunlight. Uh, not really sure about that, but uh, I'm trying to figure it out as I go along here. Yeah, yeah, it's just a huge learning curve with every single crop. And, um, you know, microgreens are something that I have barely done either. So that's, I'm going to be going through the same process here real soon. <laughs> but I'm glad to see that you're doing the microgreens because it's a really, it's just such a valuable crop, so nutritious for our customers and um, another great little stream of revenue for mm -hmm. us here on a small scale. And so now let's go check out your propagation area. This is as, as bare bones as it gets, right? <laughs> Got it looks awesome. Craigslist lumber nice. made into a little table here. Perfect, free. Um, yeah, Got, got some it. free trays from you. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for the shout out to Bootstrap Farmer yeah. on their uh, plug trays here. 
good quality plastic. Oh, for the soil mix, I just use what you taught me, basically, which uh -huh. is um, like a 4-3-2 ratio of compost, mm -hmm. peat moss, and then vermiculite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far, and I've just been dropping them uh -huh. to compact them, but as you've been telling me recently. Yeah, we learned from Dawson and mm -hmm. Ray Tyler. Oh, basically, we just don't have to pack them, apparently. Yeah. And they come out fine. I learned this trick from Dawson on my recent trip, and he learned it from Ray Tyler. Um, you don't need to pack as much soil in there as possible. You just kind of drop the soil in, leave it real loose. You know, poke your seed hole and drop the seed. And then at the end, when you're going to plant them, you can just pull straight up, and they'll just pop right out. And you don't have to take that extra step of you know using a pencil or screw to knock them out. We're both going to be trying that out now. Now that we know that trick. After I pack them, I just cover yeah. them with this um, sunshine propagation mix. Oh, nice. As um, my top cover. I'm not sure how, how wise that is, but it seems to be working all right for me so far. Yeah, it looks like you got great germination rates on, on your stuff. And what are you seeding right now in the middle of February? What are you, what are you, uh, what right now stuff? I'm seeding uh, lettuce weekly. I grow, I grow a variety of, of the lettuce heads mm -hmm. in a tray. Mm -hmm. I got some more chard coming up because again, I'm dealing with cutworm pressure. Right. So I'm gonna try it again with the, um, those paper collars that you saw before. Mm -hmm. I had terrible issues with trying to transplant beets. Uh -huh. Maybe it's just the variety, early wonder, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um, or it's, it's just been too cold recently where they all turn this reddish purple like this. Uh, uh -huh. And then even once I get them in the ground, you know, I, had, I had the cutworms to deal with. Right. So, I, so it's been not fruitful so far. Although one time um, I was low on trays and I didn't have a soil block maker, so I just mm. handmade little soil balls, basically. <laughs> and nice. those turned out well. Cool. Wow, At least the transplants did, yeah. But I ordered some uh, windstep trays. Nice. So did I. Yeah. I'm excited to try those. So, Constantly trying to get better at the propagation, trying out you know, new types of trays and soil mixes and techniques. Trying to get better. Love it. So now we're at your post-processing center, which is still in development. Mm -hmm. And uh, just tell us kind of what you got going on and how you're using it. Yeah, so again, this is the bare bones Curtis Stone model of your post-process station. Mm -hmm. Basic drying table, mm -hmm. basic washing table. Mm -hmm. I don't even have the fans yet. I'm not yeah. even sure if I'll use those. Yeah. But um, yeah, again, this is just Craigslist wood I got off for free. Sweet. This is built using your video. Cool. So there's that. <laughs> and then we got your fancy washing machine you freshly delivered today. Yeah, I just built this. I'll have a video about how I, how I built this one. So here we got our free trolls off of Craigslist. Mm -hmm. It actually ended up being like 350 to pay for the U-Haul truck to drive it down here. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so trolls off of Craigslist, and then here is the cool bot. The cool bot. Woohoo! Awesome setup. Yep. So the cool bot's like what 350. Uh huh. So AC was 100, and uh, so far it works great. Yeah. It's down to 36, 38, no problem. So cool. So a little under, so around 800 bucks, and you mm -hmm. got yourself a fridge that you can fit a lot of produce in. Yep. So it's, it's fantastic. Because when I bought my Trailson, you know, it was, it was working. It was like 1,100 bucks. So it only worked for a year. So this is such a better setup. It's perfect for us small farmers. So now that we've seen his whole farm and how he's doing everything, let's sit down with Brian and find out a little bit more about his personal story and how he got started in farming. So now I just wanted to sit down with Brian and um, so you guys could get to know him a little bit and his story and how he got involved in, in farming. You've been uh, farming now, I guess, for about a year or so since you started it with me. Yeah, that sounds about right. First yeah. year farmer. How'd you get into this and what, what got you interested and, and what were you doing before? So yeah, basically uh, I found myself with a master's degree in computer science of all things. Got my first entry level, you know, office job. And I found that I was just really not enjoying the work environment, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I'd always had like a soft spot for gardening. I've grown things growing up. And I, I've always had this lingering idea in the back of my head, like why don't we just grow things in our backyard? And this is before I found out about, you know, all these urban farmers on YouTube uh -huh. and all that. So it was this combination of being pretty dissatisfied with my work life mm -hmm. and at the same time discovering Curtis Stone and then actually, mm -hmm. your viral video, like it's up to like 700,000 views, oh, or 700,000 views. Yeah, with Epic Gardening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's really cool. So then Steven mentioned that he was in San Diego, and I was like, oh, I'll go check him out at his farmer's market, see what he's all about. And then I just randomly approached him at the La Mesa farmer's market, I think it was. Yep, I yeah. remember, I remember when you came up to me. Yeah. Was, yeah. And I said, hey, can I help out on the weekends? And then I found out that I wasn't just wearing gross tinted, tinted, uh, tinted glasses, that I actually enjoyed doing all this stuff. Yeah. And I thought, hey, I'm only 
20 something once in my life. Um, and I'm in, a, hey, I'm in a fortunate enough position where I can afford to take this risk, so I thought there's no, reason, no, no excuse not to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, after six months of apprenticing at um, your place, I left the nest basically and yeah. then uh, tried this thing out for my own. Wow, that's so cool, man. Yeah, I love hearing that story of um, the, you know dissatisfaction. I know a lot of us are really, I was dissatisfied with uh, my career field too. and. Um, I knew that I, I wanted to do something that was going to help people and give value to people, and farming is just so so great. And it's I love seeing that you know Brian had the courage to um, not only see if this was right for him, but then once he be, felt like he was ready, he jumped into it with both feet and went for it. So I just got to congratulate you on that, man. Oh, thank you. It's, um, and I love seeing what you've done with uh, your first property. So I don't know if, if you heard about this idea, where it's like. Our bodies evolved for a lifestyle, uh -huh. like you know, as hunter-gatherers, basically. And it's just, you know, working, working in an office, commuting in a car, mm. being on Facebook all the time. Yeah. To me, it's like the antithesis yeah. of the lifestyle that we're meant to live. Right. Of being human, it's the opposite of being human, really. Yeah. yeah. So in my head, I thought, well, you know, I can't go back to being a hunter-gatherer exactly, but um, a nice medium, it seemed like, would be this market garden lifestyle. You know, mm. where spend our time outdoors, we're interacting with nature. And that segues into the second main reason why I'm doing this, which is because I think we both believe in the ideal of fostering, you know, strong, self-sufficient communities where, you know, where it's people are more engaged with nature and each other than, you know, as opposed to looking at their smartphones all day. Yeah, we're trying to foster local communities and relationships with other people and food is such a great way to, to, to accomplish that. Yeah, and it's like, you can have your opinions on organic gardening and this whole space in general, but it's, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a really sinister underbelly in this industry as compared to some other ones I could, I could name. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. And yeah, us being so close and intimate with our customers, um, it, it doesn't really lend itself to becoming really gross, like kind of like the large scale agriculture has become where you're just so cut off from nature, so cut off from your end customer. And uh, that's what's really special about market gardening, I think. Now that you've developed your first property, you have some, you know, experience under your belt. How do you have any kind of thoughts on, on it now? That is it um, has it been more difficult than you thought it would be to start your own farm? Uh, has it been easier? Yeah, the main thing would be just the breadth of all the problems that I had to deal with. Like, so it's it's like no one thing is not terribly difficult. So it's not an issue of death, but an issue of breath and the amount of hats you have to wear. Mm, yeah. Like only half of the setup process was actually gardening, right? I had to become yeah. a little bit of a plumber, yeah. a little bit of like electrician, a, a fridge repair man yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. right? Uh, a marketer, you know, a, a website builder, just all yeah. these little things you have to deal with. Uh -huh. um, so that was a challenge. And of, of course, even the gardening itself is, uh, I, even after working six months with Steven, it's still I have a huge a host of problems I have to learn and deal with. So yeah, just overcoming all of the um, dozens and dozens of little issues that pop up. Yeah, yeah, especially in the beginning. It's so there's just so much to learn and do. And like yeah, as you said, this is like that's what's so crazy about farming. It's such a complex business. It's not like you have all the with all the things with growing plants that are super complex. Mm -hmm. Then you got to throw in all the other business stuff that all business owners have to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're left with this incredibly complex business that you have to run. So it's bit, um, but it's cool because you, you gain and develop all these different skills that you could apply anywhere, no matter what, what you do later in life. And, um, yeah. especially in this age where we have just a host of, of information and resources to deal with or to help us deal with our problems on YouTube and the internet in general, like my main or one of the things I actually don't like about about farming is just the amount of time you spend alone. Mm. Like yeah. I'm like I'm, I'm I'm sort of an introvert by nature, but even still, it's a lot of time spent alone. So just having podcasts and mm -hmm. videos to listen to and watch on your downtime, um, one helps you deal with that being alone, but also just helps you you know uh, troubleshoot all these different issues that yeah. we come across. Yeah, that's a really great point, and um, there's a lot of time spent alone, definitely, and. Uh, that's what's so cool now about the internet is now we, we we're, uh, we're able to kind of network with these different people maybe in Facebook groups or get advice from other people on YouTube and so yeah it helps us to not feel as alone mm -hmm. as, as I'm sure a lot of other farmers when they were just on their land they're just with their families and much yeah. more cut off yeah definitely yeah it's a great point I haven't thought about before so if you were gonna give advice to 
someone who's looking into doing this or someone who's just getting started, what are some tips that you'd give them in the beginning um, so that they could be more successful, I guess? Yeah, so I would say if you happen to know uh, a local grower in your area that's doing, doing this sort of thing, just hit them up, ask nicely if you could help them on the weekends and see if you actually enjoy this lifestyle and see if you're see if you're um, wearing rose tinted glasses. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. You know, a lot of people, f they think that they would enjoy doing farming, but, um, you know, the actual, w the amount of work that it takes and effort and, and all of that is quite a, it's quite a lot. It's, it's definitely not for everybody, but I think that's good advice to, to do it. Work an eight hour day farming all day long and, and see what that feels like. If you find um, you enjoy shoveling compost, that's a <laughs> good sign. If <laughs> that's a really good yeah. sign. Um, is there any uh, is there any teachers or, or books or things like that that you found really valuable in the beginning? Yeah, for me, it was Stephen's YouTube videos, of course. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Fortier's book, Mark, Fortier, Mark yeah. Garner. Yeah. Curtis Stone's book. Oh yeah. Well, I found his videos to be uh, equally as helpful, maybe even more. Yeah. Yeah. And then me Connor too. and then Connor Crickmore stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's those four guys for me. Absolutely. Were the uh, the bulk of my education. So one of the trickier things about farming is selling your produce once it's ready for harvest. So what are your, what are your strategies right now? What are your avenues that you're looking into selling? Yeah, so in the beginning I was just giving away free produce here and there um, as it became ready to harvest. And then I ended up getting an opportunity to sell privately at uh, a business um, office. And um, right now I'm currently in talks with them to sell to the entire building actually. Wow, that's, so, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's a five-story building, I think, so I'm looking forward to seeing how far that'll take me. And, because um, right there, that's like a private um, farmer's market in and of itself. Yeah, totally. And you're, and you're the only grower, I'm sure, that's approached them, so mm -hmm. <laughs> that's excellent. Um, any plans for farmer's markets or anything like that? Um, I think I'll pursue this private avenue first, mm -hmm. and then um, after I max out that one, which who knows how long that'll be, yeah, I'll definitely have farmers markets as well in the future, um, just for just for the uh, the social contacts, you know, maybe contacts with chefs. Who mm -hmm. knows? Yeah, yeah, that's really fantastic that he's got this first little little private thing. I think that's a great opportunity for a lot of us, especially in deeper into the city. Uh, there's a lot of these business buildings, and you know, they need food every day too, right? So, I think that hopefully that'll be a really great avenue for you. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see you know the different developments that go on as you start selling and people start hearing about you, you know, people start contacting you even. So you've got a little over 2,000 square feet in production right now. And of course, you know, you gotta get your initial sales going. What does it look like for home to home farms going into the future? Yeah, well for now it's getting in, getting this plot dialed in. Cause as you probably saw in the video, I have a bunch of things I can improve on. Like my carrot bed is producing a fraction of what it should be right now. So I think I'm only like at 50% really mm -hmm. of what I could be outputting mm -hmm. in total. So once I'm comfortable with this property, um, it'll be getting a sense of how much I can sell at this private uh, business. And then from there, I'll be looking to expand and trying to catch up to you, yeah. basically. <laughs> Sounds good. So Brian is currently selling around the kind of La Jolla UTC area of San Diego. Um, if you are interested in buying produce from him, or if you'd like to follow him on social media and Instagram, uh, where can they find you? So right now the best place would be uh, just on Instagram at, at home to home farms mm -hmm. And I've got my website, HomeToHomeFarms.com. And right now I'm currently working on, you know, setting up the uh, digital infrastructure to handle sales and nice. all that stuff. Sounds good. So yeah, I'll put a link down in the description to his social pages and his website so you can easily find it. Well, Brian, I'm really excited for you and I'm um, really proud of you, all the you know, accomplishments that you've done already. And I can't wait to see the next step for you and, and you know how far you grow this thing. So thanks so much for taking the time to, to have me out and show off your farm of and, and give advice to all of the other people starting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, thanks.